very good morning to all of you today we are going to talk about wen's tumor and we are going to start by talking about the embryology the origin of the wen's tumor and what are the syndromes associated with it and the different school of thought in the management of the wen's tumor okay so it is the most common malignant renal tumor of childhood and to understand the pathology you need to know the two basic concepts which are responsible for the origin of the wen's tumor so number one school of thought is the disorders in nephrogenesis are mainly responsible for the wen's tumor development now what is uh, happening in nephrogenesis so we know that the kidney develops from the intermediate mesoderm it forms the metanephros and which surrounds the ureteric bud forming a metanephric mesenchyme around it this metanephric mesenchyme will form the kidneys the whole of the medulla cortex the collecting system till the distal tubules and below beyond it the collecting system is all formed by the ureteric bud this metanephric mesenchyme is a meso is a mesenchymal tissue as the name suggests so but it is supposed to form the lining epithelium of the tubules as well the nephrons as well and so it has to convert or trans it has to undergo transition to a uh, epithelial tissue so it has to undergo a mesenchymal to epithelial transition this mesenchymal to epithelial transition is under the influence of certain genes for example wt1 and wt2 genes they are responsible for this transitions when there is a mutation in this genes there is a disruption of this transition so mesenchymal epithelial transitions do not happen smoothly so you find them disorganized or disrupted so for example now the cells of the mesenchyme that is the blastemal cells the stromal cells they don't completely undergo a transformation to an epithelial tissue or epithelial cells so you find an array of cells of blastema stroma and epithelial scattered in the tissue so this is the one important pathology of origin of the wen's tumor and why do you find this kind of cells you now you understand why you find blastemal cells and stromal cells as well as epithelial cells because this transition doesn't happen so you find partial epithelial cells some stromal cells and some blastemal or immature cells okay when you find all this kind of cells together in a histology of a wen's tumor this is known as a classic wen's and this is a triphasic wens also known as triphasic wens now when you don't find the transition to happen from blastema to epithelial at all so that case you find predominantly blastemal cells and that's a very indicative of a poor prognosis when you find some of these components they undergo de differentiation to form an anaplastic cell then also it's a poor prognosis so if you find anaplasia or if you find de differentiation to form an aplasia or blastema that is they don't at all match you to form a epithelial cell these are poor prognostic markers so let us discuss it here only because uh, when we discuss the management we'll again take up this point so that's why it's important we understand the different cells in the histology of a wen's tumor here only the second school of thought the second pathology for the wen's tumor is the nephrogenic rest so what is nephrogenic rest nephrogenic rest is normally 1% of the infants are born with the cells which are present in the kidneys that they can be present in the tubules or they can be present in the perilobar region or interlobar region so these cells can either undergo regression or they can remain dormant however some of the cells can undergo hyperplasia get mutated to form the tumor so the two basic pathology in the wen's tumor just to summarize one is the disorders in nephrogenesis to be more specific the mesenchymal epithelial transition gets disorganized or disrupted and that's why you find varied array of cells in the wen's tumor number two is a nephrogenic rest where 1% of those infants are normally born with it some of them might even undergo mutation to form wen's tumor okay having understood this there are few syndromes let us quickly look at the two syndromes wt1 gene is present on the chromosome 11p 13 locus so short term of chromosome 11 with 13 locus and wt2 is 11p 15 locus okay 11p 13 is related to dennis drash syndrome and wagner syndrome dennis drash is mainly related to renal mesangial sclerosis because nephrogenesis is gone so the the tubules don't develop so the whole thing is sclerosed okay and uh, in a wagner syndrome you find there is associated uh, wen's tumor anervidia genital abnormalities and retardation why is there is anervidia because it's closely related to the pax gene as well so this is the 11 chromosome wt1 gene 
and it is closely related to the Pax gene. So you find both of them mutated and you get to see a association of an anuvidia in them. 11p15 is, uh, is mainly because of genomic imprinting principle. So what happens in genomic imprinting, one of the paternal or maternal genes has to remain suppressed. Either the maternal gene will be dominant or the paternal gene will be dominant. When both of them become dominant or when both of them start expressing, there is proliferation. And this is one such factor, growth factor, which undergoes proliferation is the insulin-like growth factor too. Now, when there is proliferation, what will happen? Everything will grow. So there will be Beckwith Woodman syndrome, which manifests as hemi hypertrophy. It manifests as hyper, so you find macroglossia, you find hepatoglostoma, hep hepatoblastoma, and Wim's tumor. So it's a complex of the manifestations because of the proliferation, because of the insulin like growth factor, too. Just remember everything that we have discussed so far, but emphasize more on the histology because the whole prognosis of the Wim's tumor depends on two things. One is the stage of the disease, like any other tumor. Another is the histology of the tumor, okay? So it's very important that we have to know the stage and the histology. But regarding the stage, we cannot stage the disease right now. Okay, CT is the required, but that doesn't give you a, uh, about the exact staging. It's mainly um, helps you to rule out a metastasis, but the staging is mainly surgical. Now let us understand the management of the worm's tumor, okay? There are two school of thoughts in management. One is the children's oncology group. Other is the International Society of Pediatric Oncology. So the children's oncology group, it suggests that go for an upfront surgery. Okay, go for an upfront surgery. However, International Society of Pediatric Oncologists, they say that go for a neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by a surgery. Okay, so surgery... But then uh, children's oncology group doesn't recommend always go for a surgery. They have certain indications when you can go for a upfront chemotherapy as well. Majority of the times it says go for an upfront surgery. However, you can go for an upfront chemo if this is a solitary kidney or if it's a bilateral worm's tumor. Okay, in those cases you can go for a uh, or if there is an inoperable tumor. Then you don't have any option. You go for an upfront chemo. However, in most of the other cases, you go for a radical nephrectomy first. However, in the SIOP guidelines, it says you go for the chemotherapy always. Don't even do a biopsy. Straightforward chemotherapy followed by a radical nephrectomy. So that is what the SIOP says. So this is the only difference. But does it really matter? No, it doesn't matter because the overall survival is still more than 90%. Whatever path you choose, whether you choose COG or whether you choose SIOP, it doesn't matter. The overall survival remains the same. Okay. This is the only difference. But when you try to read, there is a lot of pros and cons. And I'll, I'll just tell you one of, one of the advantage of an SIOP. It says that if you give an ERGM and chemotherapy, it might downstage the tumor and you're tumor might become feasible for a nephron sparing surgery. This is one of the advantages of a neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, otherwise, uh, the survival and the for most of the uh, other parameters remains the same in terms of the uh, adjuvant treatment and all. So, whether you do give a neoadjuvant chemotherapy or not, you do a radical nephrectomy and that is when the staging will be done. So whole staging of the Wilms tumor is the surgical staging, okay? Look at the staging. Now again, don't get confused when you get to see COG on the left side, SIOP on the right side. So it's all the same, okay? The whole crux is the same. I've kept it just to show that uh, overall there are five stages and stage four is a metastasis, stage five is bilateral. Just, just have to remember stage one, two, and three. One is always confined to the kidney, so there is no point in under so it's very easy to remember one so you people don't end up confusing two and three so just remember two is slightly extra capsular extension however three is spillage lymph nodes ibc thrombus most of them come under stage three but then how is siop slightly different if you are to know uh, just one or two differences then it is so you have given a chemotherapy okay so you might find necrotic nodes also in the abdomen so in that case even a necrotic node has to be given importance and considered to be positive okay so necrotic tumor considered as positive even if they don't have a viable tumor in them even if you find the margins of the tumor are having necrosis they are considered as positive even they don't have a non-viable or even if they have a viable tumor 
So these are the two things that has to be emphasized. Otherwise, uh, most of the things are same in the two staging. You got a stage. So you have done the primary treatment. Either you have done a primary chemotherapy or you have started with the primary surgery itself. Your adjuvant treatment will be based on your risk stratification. So how do you risk stratify the patients? It's mainly based on the histology. So if you look at the adjuvant treatment, so the adjuvant treatment would be can be of two types, adjuvant chemotherapy, adjuvant radiotherapy. Why radiotherapy? Because they are highly radiosensitive tumors. Now, not radiotherapy to all the patients. There are certain indications of radiation. Now, but adjuvant radio chemotherapy are usually recommended to all the patients. Okay. Now, if you look at this risk stratification, now there are two ways to risk stratify them. One, the COG does risk stratification into favorable histology versus unfavorable histology that is given by COG that is favorable histology versus unfavorable histology and low intermediate and high risk is given by SIOP low intermediate and high risk when you try to read them it's very complex you might end up confusing the two so this is just a summary to help you understand and remember the basics management for the Wilms tumor the adjuvant treatment okay so the overall, the favorable histology or low intermediate risk, you can group them together. And the unfavorable histology and high risk of SIOP can group them together. If you look at the adjuvant treatment, it depends on the stage of the disease. So stage one and two, the adjuvant treatment is vincristin and actinomycin D or VA. And the, for stage three and four, it becomes VAD. That is, you add an oxytocin with it. You also add radiotherapy when there is a Stage 3, 4, favorable histology or a good histology patient, still you offer a radiotherapy to them. Okay. In case of a high risk, you offer, you can offer doxorubicin in the first setting as well, even in a stage 1 tumor and stage 2 to 3, 4, and you are very concerned about a, about an aggressive disease. And in that case, you offer the multiple chemotherapy uh, drugs. The common recommended ones are etoposide, irinotec, and cyclophosphamide carboplatin. Remember, uh, this is very important. You add radiotherapy from stage two, three, and four of an unfavorable risk or an unfavorable histology or a high risk. Okay. This is the cross adjuvant treatment of the Wilms tumor. And the primary treatment depends on you, whatever you follow. Just stick to that. You can follow the COG guidelines. You can follow the SIOP guidelines. COG is upfront surgery. However, there are certain contraindications. Very straightforward. Go for a chemotherapy followed by surgery. SIOP is always surgery, always chemotherapy. Whenever you offer chemotherapy in SIOP, it doesn't even recommend a biopsy. There has been a UK study which has modified the SIOP uh, guidelines and they have included biopsy before a chemotherapy. Now, why a biopsy before a chemotherapy? It has found that the tumors which are appearing to be worms in a CT or in a history might turn out to be in 10% of the cases non worms tumor. Okay, and 1% of the time they can be benign as well. So that is why the UK study, they recommend getting a biopsy prior to a chemotherapy as well. Okay, so this is the gross management, the gross histology, the gross uh, 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 embryology and the origin of the Wilms tumor. And uh, hope you find this useful. If you have any queries, let me know in the comments. Till then, take care. Goodbye.